started a uh, speaker series last uh, fall, and uh, this is our second here with, uh, as you undoubtedly all know, Mr. Uh, Mike Decker, uh, who was uh, formerly for a long time the uh, either the Deputy Director of Intelligence or uh, very often in my uh, tenure in the Marine Corps, the, uh, the acting or serving deputy or serving Director of Intelligence for Headquarters Marine Corps. Uh, it is really an honor and a privilege to do that. We've known each other for a little bit over 20 years now, uh, when I was a much handsomer major coming back from, uh, from Somalia. That was my first uh, uh, chance to meet uh, with him. And uh, he's got a great story to tell. And basically, uh, uh, back in uh, that time frame, Marine Corps Intelligence was, uh, was a much smaller and uh, less capable entity than it was, uh, than it is now, uh, because we're kind of recovering after Desert Storm, and uh, uh, he went through the process of drawing it into a, a billion dollar enterprise, and one that was ready for the challenges of Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, our country has benefited very greatly, directly uh, based on his efforts over a, over a 10 year span. So uh, it's uh, uh, my distinct privilege to introduce Thanks, Mr. Mike Decker. All right. We're going to try to, I'm going to try to. Interesting that really has to do with a very slow, steady slog through a programming and budgeting and training and manpower system. Um, and I've got uh, some experts here, Larry Pryor, Admiral Loveless, Collins here. I mean, so uh, just interrupt any time I say it wrong and uh, t tell me where I, where I can uh, fix the presentation. Brian, if you... This is kind of what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the problem that as people saw it as we came out of Desert Storm, where a lot of people thought Marine Corps intelligence kind of failed. Um, you know, I didn't, but a lot of people did. Um, the environment that we were in when we were trying to fix this and kind of just go through some things and then talk a little bit about Afghanistan and that. Um, afterwards, if, you, if we have time, I will tell you a story about Major Fritz Barth in Bogadishu that involves um, uh, four Humvee tires and a frozen bottle of Matus Rosé. But there, there, and there's a, there was sort of a, a bartering system there. I guess you chose Matus over Cot based on the... <laughs> they weren't offering that? Okay, great. Next slide. So first of all, I wanted to think of a way to make this sort of interesting and say, why do people care about sort of this topic? And this is really small print, I'm sorry, but I'll read a couple of things on here. This is not from back after Desert Storm. This is from General Dunford, who just took over as Commandant. And so this just is to remind you why this is important. Here's the new Commandant just took over. He goes around for a couple of months and talks to all of his generals before he publishes his guidance as the new Commandant. Here's the things I'm worried about. And look what the new Commandant says. He says, We've got a real problem in that we have significant gaps among our small unit leaders, especially our technical leaders aren't qualified. I'm really worried about our inventory of NCOs. It's not meeting our requirements. And when you add all this up, combat effectiveness is degraded. And that's kind of where we were uh, in Desert Storm for Marine Corps intelligence. So the next slide is my problem statement, which is General Paul Van Riper was a one star at Quantico. He was part of the Combat Development Command and he flew over to the war zone and didn't have a job, so he basically wandered around with a notebook and went to every briefing and every meeting and took notes and talked about, you know, heard about how, how things were going in Marine Corps intelligence and, and aviation, and he came back and wrote an article for the Marine Corps Gazette about how things went and what he saw when he was over there for Desert Storm, and here we are, headlined. You know, one of the little subheadings like they have in Marine Corps Gazette articles. The weakest area I observed was tactical intelligence. Ouch. You know, that kind of hurts. So, next slide. Um, and here's, here's some of the details of what, you know, kind of, he wrote an article and talked about air support, artillery support, you know. Uh, he, he really beat up on uh, majors in general, which was good. It wasn't just intel officers. He, he talked about the fact that most Marine Corps majors had been out of their infantry and artillery specialties so much working at headquarters Marine Corps and working on recruiting duty and at the drill field that they weren't very good at being opsos, et cetera. But, you know, he, he saved a lot of his uh, barbs for us. And he said, really, we need to reconsider acquiring intelligence officers via lateral moves. I was one of those. Um, and a lateral move in the Marine Corps means when you're a captain, if your military occupational specialty or MOS is too full, 
and they want to and uh, another one is short like intelligence they would let you move over even if you didn't know a darn thing about it general van riper's favorite saying was that most people weren't running uh towards the intelligence mos they were running away from their old mos hopefully i wasn't one of those uh but he never told me um we really he said we really didn't establish an operational mindset in our intelligence officers and of course you know he didn't spend enough time with me i guess um but he did with you know he, some of the people that he did spend a lot of time with he was down uh in Riyadh a lot and we did have a couple of intel officers down there that, that were having some problems and he seemed to be spending a lot of time with them um, he said we were fascinated with systems and procedures vice products and what I used to tell him all the time was if someone comes into you from the fire support coordination center and says unless you give me a you know a company of trucks and allow me to shift more ammo 30 miles forward we're not going to be able to range the target tomorrow you just look at them and go oh okay that makes sense take a company of trucks if an intelligence guy comes to you and says, I'm sorry, but the Pioneer unmanned aerial vehicle won't fly that far, or the downlink for the imagery won't reach that far, you look at him and go, why are you intel guys always talking about systems, you know? So I said, I don't know why you do that. So I, I kind of, when, I, when he did hire me to work up there, I used to have some conversations with him and say, could you tweak the way you say some of these things? Because <laughs> you're picking on us. Um, he wanted to change uh, intel training and of course a lot of people after Desert Storm had this great fascination with IPB intel prep of the battlefield and a lot of people had and I'll talk about that in a minute and uh, of course what happened though is after people thought about it for a while they started to say maybe some of that army think on synchronization might not be the greatest thing because it, 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 it ties you to phase lines where uh, I know Colin's having a heart attack over here but um, you know, uh, it, it tied the Army to phase lines and decision points that maybe they could have blown past had they once the situation changed. But, it, it, you know, their kind of version of a mission-type order was to have, you know, go to this point and then stop and, 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 and then wait till midnight the next day, you know, or whatever, some of these things, when really some of their forward units had actually pushed way beyond those points. So I don't know that it was always the greatest thing. And then he was very big on trying to get more imagery support. Um, everybody thought that imagery support was horrible. I think everybody who worked on, on the Hill at the time thought that, and I'll have a couple of examples of that in the discussion here. But uh, you know, they were pushing, uh, the one thing they really thought they could fix was IPV and imagery support. So the next slide, Brian. So I just wanted to say, and that's not me, that's an army officer there. But this is just uh, to tell you a little bit about what General Van Riper had in his mind. You know, the Army had this great intelligence prep of the battlefield process and there'd be phase lines and say, and they'd, they'd, they'd walk through these things and say, if we attack with two divisions into Southeast Kuwait uh, at the 12 hour point, the Iraqi Army is likely to do this and therefore we'll do this. And you'd work through all these uh, games and work your way through IPB. And it was a great way you define the environment describe the battle, fa battle space, evaluate the adversary, and then determine the adversary's courses of actions. You'd actually walk through this stuff and say, we think at this point, you know, the enemy's going to have to fall back to this point. We think at this point they're going to fire all their artillery, but once we get this far, they're, they're, they won't be able to hit us with their artillery, and therefore we should do this. And you kind of gamed your way through it. It was a pretty good system. But I came to the conclusion, talking with General Van Riper, that what he, what he was really talking about was that the Army brought all of their intel officers in as second lieutenants right out of college. They would go out to Fort Huachuca and they would go through this training program and they would train to be second lieutenant intelligence officers. So by the time they became a captain and served as a battalion intel officer or uh, were about to pin on major and they were serving as a regimental or a brigade intel officer, um, they had eight to ten years of experience doing intelligence work. Whereas people like me, I had been an intelligence officer for about a year and a half when Desert Storm started. You know, so what I used to say is that where General, when intel officers would challenge me and they would say, why is General Van Riper beating up, up on us all the time? I would say, well, no, what he's saying is that these intel officers in the Army have twice as much experience as you have. And that's a true statement. And then the other thing was that Fort Huachuca was a 20-week school. And then on top of that, when you were a captain, they had an advanced school. For the Marine Corps, what we had was one 10-week school except Larry and a few other people that went to Lowry and went through the Air Force School before we ever even had our own school. So I said, what you're really looking at here is that what General Van Riper did is he would go to visit an Army Brigade or Regiment and, and talk to their two, and their two, would have, uh, their two would have twice as much experience, twice as much knowledge of IPB, twice as much knowledge of how to support a maneuver unit, et cetera, and twice as much education and training. And that was a true statement. So the next slide. And they were better looking. They were, back in the day. I'm not saying now, yeah. you know, but then. So um, 
one of my good buddies, Chuck Colvard, after General Van Riper wrote that article for the Gazette, Chuck and I decided that we were going to write articles for the Gazette and say that he was wrong, or at least say he was right, and, but here's where he's wrong and how to fix it. And, and Chuck wrote this article, unfortunately we fought like we trained. And of course there's that great old saying that we ought to train like we're going to fight, and he flipped that sentence around and said, unfortunately for Marine Corps intelligence, we fought like we trained. And part of what he was saying was, if you conduct all of your training where your unit operations officer reserves LZ Bluebird at Camp Lejeune as, as the place where the enemy's going to be next week on Thursday afternoon, and that's the only place you're allowed to land the helicopters, then the intelligence officers don't really get any training. What the intelligence officers do is they stand up with a fake map and say, the enemy's at LZ Bluebird, landing zone Bluebird. And, uh, and that's, that's, there's no training for your intelligence people. It's not dynamic. It's not free play. Um, Chuck, Chuck agreed. He said, you know, and w because we don't have good training, it really had a, uh, an adverse impact on our operations over there. Uh, but he also said we really need to train our operations officers, in other words, our S3s and our commanding officers of battalions and regiments, to understand intelligence. Because they clearly were asking their intelligence people for things they didn't understand. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I, one time, I had one, uh, the deputy MEF commander at the time, General Hopkins, you know, made the comment. He said, I, can under I understand how to allocate fire support. I don't understand how to allocate bandwidth. What does that mean? You know, what am I doing? And I would say, well, sir, you know, it, and of course, back in those days in the circuits we had, you know, it takes 15 minutes to send a picture somewhere, and you have to decide who's going to get the picture because you're only up, you know, in an hour, you can only send four of them, you know. Oh, so is someone prioritizing all that? I said, we're trying, you know, but they really didn't understand this. They didn't understand a lot of the ranges of things. They didn't understand how much data was coming off the satellites and from the, the manned and unmanned platforms and who was looking at it all. Where was it going? They just didn't kind of have this understanding, which they kind of grow up learning about that when it comes to landing plans, when it comes to uh, uh, time distance equations for helicopters versus trucks and tanks and those kinds of things. But they just, you know, didn't grow up thinking about uh, intelligence support. So he, and, and the other thing was, Marine Corps intelligence had a really large number of limited duty officers or LDOs, and they were great guys, but as one director of intelligence told me one time, um, nobody likes to play in the farm team. They all want to be in the major league, and the major league was viewed to be DIA, NSA, CIA. And so what was happening was, any time they could, a lot of these limited duty officers were asking for tours in Washington. And what that meant was you usually had a more junior officer out in the operating forces than you should have had. And so Chuck's comment, and Chuck was an LDO, and he was a great guy. Um, you know he's an LDO because one day over in uh, Jubail in Saudi Arabia during Desert Storm, he said, my chest feels a little tight. Um, I think I'm going to go for a run to loosen it up. And it was like 105 out. And he came back from the run and it looked like he was going to die because he was about to die. And we wound up, he had a heart attack and then went for a run in 105 degree weather to try to shake it off. So anyway, that was Chuck for you though. God rest his soul. And then um, Intel dri drives operations has to be more than just a saying. And the other thing that Chuck pushed real hard for was we need to put colonels into our G2 positions. Um, we had... Uh, for the first, I was over at Des I was deployed for Desert Storm a couple of days after Iraq invaded. I came home six months and a few days later, and I think that for the four of the months that I was over there, there were zero intelligence colonels in the Marine Corps in theater. Around Thanksgiving or Christmas time, one intel colonel showed up to be the G2, um, and uh, you know, and but he was not the person we had lived with for the four or five months before that. Um, and I'll talk more about intelligence colonels in a minute, but. Uh, basically, we had a lieutenant colonel as our G2 for the MEF, and he was dealing with five or six colonels in the G3. Because the G3, the G3 Alpha, the G3 Plans Officer, the Fire Support Coordinator, you know, the, the Liaison Officer to the 82nd Airborne, all those guys were colonels. You know, and so you had one lieutenant colonel trying to, you know, basically placate that. And, and, it, and having an eagle on your collar is a big deal. Next slide. And then this really uppity uh, captain decided that he was going to write an article for the Gazette, too. And I focused a little bit, because I was the senior analyst for the MEF, I focused a little bit on kind of how the analytical problem went. And, you know, I, I pointed out that, that we estimated that the, that the MEF was going to face in southeast Kuwait about 1,000 tanks, and there were really only 900, and I thought that was pretty good, considering, you know, we were basically on a sleep deprivation experiment for six months out there trying to count tanks and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we were wrong on air power. We actually thought more of the Iraqi Air Force was going to at least take one shot at us, and instead they all flew to Iran and, and parked, more or less. One or two got shot down. 
Um, I said, I said uh, we were a little bit wrong on terrorism and chemical weapons too. Or we, to this day, I'm surprised that um, given how porous the border was, that Saddam didn't send terrorists down, but I think he didn't want to piss off Saudi Arabia. He probably wouldn't have cared about us, but he probably didn't want to, the Saudis to say that you, you came into our country and, and caused trouble. Um, and I, but I agreed with General Van Riper. I said, we really can fix manning, intel officer selection and training. We really need to do something about photo reconnaissance. Um, for those of you that recall, the Marine Corps used to have um, RF-4Bs, which was a reconnaissance variant of the old F-4 uh, aircraft. And uh, those were actually mothballed and had a big ceremony and the squadron stood down and all the airplanes were decommissioned uh, in July of 1990, of 1990 and Saddam invaded like on August the 3rd. And uh, half the message traffic for the first two weeks that we were getting ready to deploy was, can we, can we turn them back on? And it was like, oh no, from a maintenance perspective, you can't do that. They've been, they're dead. So anyway. Like the, yeah, you know, I, and ask a question anytime because yeah, the go ahead. Things that you you assess that you were wrong on mode. Yeah, didn't you? I mean, we were all trained to brief the most dangerous course of action. Yeah. So if they had the capability, you know, it's the old oh, yeah. capability and intent. Yeah. And what they actually chose to do, but. No, when when uh, yeah, I mean, and you you always say um, most likely course of action, least likely course of action, most dangerous course of action, and we were doing that, and I can I can recall very vividly having a colonel get pretty mad at me because we'd, we'd only been ashore a couple of weeks and there was one infantry battalion between us and where the MPS ships were offloading and they were like right on the road halfway to Kuwait and it was General Mattis's battalion. He was lieutenant colonel. He'd come down every night to the skiff to see what we knew and, uh, and he, was a, he was a great customer of intel. He'd pull up a mount out box and sit by the map and talk to the corporals and sergeants for an hour every night. But um, he said uh, at one of the briefings one day I said, um, there's, a, there's two Iraqi armored brigades right on the other side of the Kuwait border from, from the Saudis, and the Saudis have a battalion. And then a few miles further down the road, there's a Marine battalion, and then us. And I said, I said you know, those, those tanks could be here in a matter of hours. And the G3 said, of course not. There's a Marine battalion between here and there. And I said, yes, but each one of their brigades has 100 tanks and they can drive cross country. I said, if 200 tanks start coming down that road, there's a really good chance that a couple dozen at least will make it here, don't you think? He's like, no, there's a Marine battalion in the way. I said, I don't think a, a single Marine battalion has enough anti-tank weapons. I mean, you know, you start doing these math problems for them. You know, if every Marine in the battalion fired, a, fired an anti-tank weapon, then you would be able to stop 200 tanks, but not, not every Marine in the battalion has one. You know, we have these circular discussions with them, but you're right, we're briefing most dangerous courses of action. Afterwards, General Boomer, who was the MEF commander, uh, talked to me uh, when we were back at Camp Pendleton and General Myatt, who was the division commander, and, and both of them said that they preferred having the estimate be 1,000 tanks rather than 900, rather than having it be way too low. And what it, what it essentially was is that there, it's, it's just such a mess when you have an area that size and you have 900 tanks, we were actually double counting one brigade. We had human reporting on, on one numbered brigade from line crossers that we had captured, and, but we could never find that brigade. And so we just kept counting one extra brigade. So that's where the extra 100 tanks came from. So yeah, does anybody have any other questions about anything up so far? All right, go ahead. So anyway, here's the budget environment we're in. They, they tell us, let's, let's try to fix uh, Marine Corps intelligence. Oh, and oh, oh, by the way, there's a peace dividend. The Marine Corps is going to get 13% smaller over the next couple of years. And it happened really fast. So this is pretty scary. The Marine Corps is dropping from 196,000 to 171,000. I think we wound up only dropping to 175. It's always a negotiated uh, figure. The, 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 figure. the target figure was 175, but the actual manning was 171, 154. But I'm just you know, pointing out that General Van Riper put together the Intel plan and got it all approved in 1994. And uh, we were told, okay, uh, the plan is approved. Um, all you staff guys go make the money and the people happen. You know, and oh, by the way, everybody's losing right now. What are you going to do about it? So um, one of the things that General Van Riper decided was that in order to win this fight at a time when the Marine Corps was downsizing, because his position was that the Marine, Marine Corps intelligence probably had to double. So at a time when other people are giving up infantry battalions and things like that, and he's thinking to himself, I think Marine Corps intelligence is about half as big as it should be. 
he sort of embarked upon this data collection thing to compare us to other services. Because one of the ways that you can win some of these battles is you can go and say, you know, well, the Army's 3.5% intelligence. How come we're 1.5% intelligence of our end strength and that kind of thing? So if you go to the next slide. And one of the things that drove a lot of people in the Marine Corps crazy, and you still hear them talk about it, is the DODIG said Marine Corps, Marine Corps is screwed up. Well, they did, but it was because General Van Riper asked them to. There was an office in the DODIG, that, uh, in Inspector General's office, that did assessments, and General Van Riper heard about them, and he called them in one day, and he said, uh, he said, you know, I, I think the Marine Corps is like 1.5% of the Marine Corps is, uh, is devoted to intelligence, and I think like in the Navy it's 3 or 4% and in the Army it's 3 or 4%. Could you guys do some kind of a study for me to show me how we compare to everybody else and make some recommendations on what you think we ought to do? And that's kind of what the DODIG came back and said, hey, you know, you're right. You're, you're less than half as big as everybody else. You yeah. That disparity, we attributed that to Darwinism. <laughs> It could be, yeah. So, and then the other thing that uh, General Van Riper did was he, he, he uh, went and looked at the Army as a model and said, well, there's a lot of things the Army did really well in Desert Storm. Let's see which ones of those things we can do. Well, we went and got the uh, third U.S. Army report that, who was the two there, General Stewart? General For, Stewart yeah. yeah, General Stewart wrote a really good after action report, which I can email you a copy of if you want. It's uh, unclassified. Um, where he talked about all the stuff the 3rd U.S. Army did, that, which would be our sent, Army Central Command was TUSA, or 3rd U.S. Army. And he wrote a really great after-action report where he talked about all the stuff that he thought went right and all the stuff the Army should probably try to fix. And there was far more stuff that went right than stuff they needed to fix. But one of the first things that he said was, we deployed seven military intelligence battalions and three military intelligence brigades. At the time of Desert Storm, the Marine Corps deployed one intelligence battalion, and it was actually a SIGINT battalion because that was all we had. Um, the, uh, one of the things that he talked a lot about, and I'll, I'll have another slide on this, is echelon above core and echelon core and below all being focused on pushing intel support down to the maneuver divisions and to the maneuver brigades, and that that was their focus. Um, and, he, and, and, and to some extent, he was right. Those of us that were at the brigade or the MEF headquarters on the Marine Corps side could barely keep up with talking to, uh, keeping the generals current, let alone trying to push much down to the lower level units. Um, he said that one of the things that um, General Stewart said, which I talked to a lot of Army guys after Desert Storm, and they said it wasn't always perfect. A lot of it was personality based. But he said that the Army doctrine that talks about the difference between what a staff officer does and what an MI unit commander does was pretty good doctrine. Hey, Tom, there's some seats over here. Come on in. And uh, yeah, come on in. But um, and he said that doctrine was actually pretty good and it worked really well. Now, if you ever talk to any Army people, they'll say, well, it all depends. If you're a Division MI battalion and your G2 doesn't like you, then your life's going to be hell, et cetera. But it, you know, it can be personality-based. But he said at least they had a doctrine for it, which the Marine Corps didn't. Um, he talked about the training and experience of S2s. Again, this is that issue of you're a battalion S2, you've got 8 to 10 years of experience, and you really know what you're doing by the time you're on the battlefield. Um, and also all the ISR systems and comms and... You know, I've got backup slides that list it all out, you know, but he went on and on about J-STARS and, you know, SIGINT vehicles and the TKs, the vehicles they have for doing SIGINT processing, etc. So, next slide. So, just a little bit about Army, for those of you that don't know. The Army deployed 3rd U.S. Army to the war, and that, that's echelon above Corps, and they have an MI brigade. I think it's the 513th? It used to be. Right. Yeah. And then the Army has, a, 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 a field army can have anywhere from two to five uh, cores, I mean, uh, multiple cores, and anything below that red line would be con considered echelon core and below, and they brought two cores under that army to uh, Desert Storm, I believe, and so there was, so that, those would be the three MI brigades, and then every division had an MI battalion, you know, Marine divisions had a G2 shop, you know, with two dozen people in it, and that was it. No MI battalion, no nothing. So this is just one thing about the army. And then this slide is really tells, telling about the Army. Next slide. So this is Army Intelligence and Security Command. So this would be the equivalent of MCIA, the Marine Corps Intelligence Activity. In 1990, when Desert Storm started, the Marine Corps Intelligence Activity had like 30 people in it. The Army today, and of course this is bigger now, Colin will tell you, than it was back then, but has 17,000 people in it. So um, basically, the, the Army's not echelon above core, but 
echelon above echelon core. Their service level organization is like five times bigger than Marine Corps intelligence <laughs> going into Desert Storm. So it's not something that we could scale, but it was something that we could at least hold up and say, if we at least want to be competitive, because part of what we came out of Desert Storm thinking about, if, are those of you that have heard about things like Land Component Commander, Maritime Component Commander, um, the Marine Corps used to call Marine Forces Pacific and Marine Forces Atlantic, you know, they, um, they used to be called um, FMF PAC and FMF LAN because the Marine Corps had always grown up being part of the fleet, you know, and being, and being under the fleet. And we said, hey, wait a minute, if we want to be a real component commander, you know, this was the first war since Goldwater Nichols. Goldwater Nichols was 1986. So this was like the first big war where anybody really tried to have a land component commander, those kinds of things. Uh, part of General Van Riper's argument was if the Marine Corps wants to really play in the joint world that's envisioned by Goldwater Nichols, the Marine Corps needs to have the intelligence apparatus to be able to say, we can provide a JTF J2. We can serve as a land component commander. We can serve as a maritime component commander. And uh, it didn't necessarily mean we had to get this big, but it just shows you how big Army was compared to us. By way of yeah. comparison now, Mr. Decker, in CIA, where Dave and I yeah. have driven up today, just shy of 500 people. Right, if you don't count the battalion up at Fort Meade, right? No, we don't. That yeah, uh -huh. right. So um, MCA went, uh, so that's a good example of growth, though, is that MCA went from having 30 or 40 people in Desert Storm to having 500 now, which is pretty good. That's about, you know, 10 or, 10 or 12 times growth. And then the other thing that the Marine Corps did was they put the SIGINT battalion up at Fort Meade under MCIA. I know that they still are working for NSA, but you have the ability to draw up on them for, for certain support functions. Yeah. Do you have a question, Dave? No question. I, I'll, I'm going to tag off that. I mean, yeah. You see 9 and AOG right there in the yeah. unit. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, this is the Army's human units. CI, that's the CI brigade and a human correct. Yeah, correct. unit. Correct. Yeah. Look what we have at MCIA to support the service for CI unit. Uh-huh. Both. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, and, and of course, we, we call it a company at MCI, a CI human support company, or some people call it the cheesy company, right? Do they still call it that? You try to you trying to avoid that? You're going to try, change the name? Yeah. But, uh, Anyway, no. The Marine Corps does many things much smaller, and, and, and Colin will tell you that, you know, being in the Pentagon, you know, there'll be a lot of meetings where the Army will send colonels and the Marines will send majors, and that's just how we are. We're small. But uh, we, we decided we didn't want to be outrageously small. Okay, so we wanted to somehow hit some happy medium. So, the next slide, Brian. So... The, uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about was that, that um, and this is why when we talked about this, this topic, I was thinking to myself, how do you make this kind of interesting? Because it's a little bit boring to say, you know, in order to have a, all of my divisions and wings and MEFs and key billets at headquarters Marine Corps are filled by colonels and I'm an intel officer, I really ought to have about 20 some colonels in the Marine Corps. Um, and or I, I guess it was uh, 23 was what it was back then. Um, and we didn't even have one to take with us to the war. We had to steal one from somewhere uh, back in 1990. Um, so what, what does that mean? Well, part of what was going on was the Marine Corps had sort of evolved over time into this really interest. Larry, were you uh, intel right out of second lieutenant? I was. Right you were, so you were in the second year that happened or the first year? Um, 77. So 70. Right at that time when, when Kevin McCarthy in your class and that group? Or? No. no? Okay, so you were, you, were, you were in the second year, I think, of... So the Marine Corps, it wasn't until the late 70s that the Marine Corps actually took lieutenants right out of the basic school and sent them through to be intel officers. We didn't even have a school for them to go to, so they all went to Lowry Air Force Base to go through the Air Force School. So if you start to... Part of, I, in the course yeah, that I... They loved us on base. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm sure you, you, you marched around and uh, yelled at them for having their hands in their pockets and all kinds of stuff, right? They didn't know what to do with you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and my son was in the Air Force, so I tease him all the time. But uh, anyway, uh, so the Marine Corps had evolved into this system where they had a lot of warrant officers and a lot of limited duty officers. And if you take the typical Marine Corps progression from lieutenant up to colonel, at any given time, the Marine Corps has about 5,000 lieutenants and about 600 colonels. All right. So in the late 70s, the Marine Corps started to send 25 lieutenants a year through um, intel school to become intel lieutenants. Well, obviously, 
25 lieutenants can't generate 23 colonels unless they all decide to stay in and all get promoted at every step along the way, which would be kind of a miracle, you know? Uh, and so what basically had happened was the Marine Corps had this large number of warrant officers that were doing work that probably should have been done by lieutenants. The Marine Corps had a large number of limited duty officers that were doing the work of captains, majors, and lieutenant colonels because they were captains, majors, and lieutenant colonels. We had a large number of lat movers. I would have been in this part of the pyramid over here, um, this lateral move part of the pyramid. But when you get to the top of the pyramid, what that means is there aren't colonels there because uh, limited duty officers can't make colonel. They, they top out at lieutenant colonel. Just by law, they're in a different category, so they can't make it. Um, we, have this, we had a reserve officer program study that was done, and again, General Van Riper was kind of cheering this on, but he wasn't the one who thought of it. It was a lot of different MOSs uh, that came home from Desert Storm and said, we really were short majors and lieutenant colonels, and we think the reason is that we have so many warrant officers and limited duty officers that it's choking our career progression, and it was. And so we weren't the only uh, uh, group that, that looked like this, but this was, this was what we looked like. And so what, what you would do is you would go to those jobs where a second lieutenant can really learn how to be a good intel officer and something like a scout sniper platoon commander or the uh, ground sensor platoon commander or, or some of these other platoon commander jobs and because there were only a couple dozen lieutenants in the Marine Corps at any given time in intelligence none of those jobs were being held by lieutenants they were all being held by warrant officers so uh, this this was a real problem so um, General Van Riper kind of pulled the team together to talk about this and the next slide talks about kind of General Van Riper having come up through, um, and, and, and I love General Van Riper, you know, he was a Silver Star winner from Vietnam, he was a prior enlisted guy. I told him, I said, when, when he hired me to work there, I said, you're, you're really taking a big step hiring somebody who was born after you came in the Marine Corps. I mean, this guy had been in the Marine Corps, hooking and jabbing for a lot of years, um, and he had been in the Marine Corps 35 years, and I was 34 when he hired me to come there or whatever. I mean, it was just crazy. But um, General Van Riper was really big on warfighting doctrine and the, and the importance of, of our doctrine and, and writing down principles. And so General Van Riper said, before we, come, we actually implement this plan, I want to come up with you know, a list of principles that are the things we're going to use. And when people say, why are you doing that? We'll be able to say, oh, it's one of our principles is that we focus on tactical intelligence. You know, I'm not going to try to have a 17,000 man MCIA like INSCOM does because there's a whole bunch of strategic things that the Army will do for the Marine Corps, thank you, um, and, that, and that we'll just take, take advantage of that and we won't do s some of the strategic things. Dave's back there shaking his head because that's what he's stuck with right now is that, you know, the Army's doing a lot of strategic uh, human and SIGINT and, and we're not. Huh? It was a muscle twitch? It was involuntary? Tony, when Dave does that, just hit him. Okay. And... Uh, the, but anyway, you know, the Marine Corps focus is tactical and our intel focus must be downward. Now we've changed some of that over time because over time we've realized, especially since the creation of the Director of National Intelligence and the creation of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, that there's this superstructure uh, of intelligence activity that's occurring that we have to be a part of or we're, we're really left out. So in the same way that we said, hey, after Goldwater Nichols, the Marine Corps really needs to be capable of fielding a, a land component commander, a JTF commander, etc. We've, we've kind of pushed a little bit, and like I say, MCA has gotten out of about 500 people down there uh, at Quantico. But um, our focus is going to be downward. We're going to try to make intelligence drives operations, not just a saying. You know, we're going to try to institute into our training. We started doing a lot more uh, free play with the Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit Special Ops uh, Program. You would actually reserve about five or six training areas, and you, would, and, and you wouldn't know till six hours before you were taken off where the enemy was you know, until the intelligence assets found them. We started doing a little bit more free play, so people actually had to talk to the two and ask the two, how do you know they're there? You know, what's the threat at that location, etc. We did a lot of that. Um, General Van, one of his, General Van Riper's principles was, the intel effort must be directed and managed by a multidisciplined trained intelligence officer. And so well, what General Van Riper was talking about there was, I'm gonna bring him in as lieutenants, and by the time they get to be a Marine Expeditionary Unit S2, as a major, um, they're going to have 10 years, 12 years of intel experience. Because I got to tell you, there were, there was, there, we were putting out Marine Expeditionary Unit S2s, the primo job in the Marine Corps, the guy who's going to go do a NEO in Beirut, the guy who's going to go and uh, go into Bosnia and, uh, or into Kosovo and, and, and get in between the warring factions. This, and a lot of times those guys had only been an intel officer about a year, year and a half. I was the senior analyst for a Marine Expeditionary Brigade and then became the senior analyst for a Marine Expeditionary Force. Um, 
a few a week later or so when the MEF showed up, you know, and I had been an Intel officer about a year and a half. And my sole experience had been being the deputy S2 on a Marine Expeditionary Unit for eight months out in the Western Pacific. And got home and then got thrown on a plane to Saudi Arabia, you know. Um, intelligence staffs use intelligence, organizations produce intelligence. This was General Van Riper picking up on General Stewart's comment in his Desert Storm After Action report that you have to know your role. If your role is to be on the staff, and, and do staff work, then you do staff work. Don't meddle in the commander's job being a commander. And he tried to really draw a line between what it meant to be a G2 or an S2 and what it meant to be an Intel Battalion commander, an Intel Company commander, etc. Um, the product has to be timely and tailored to the, to the unit and its mission. That makes sense if you're focused downward. And then he also changed the Intel cycle. And I think the Army, uh, slightly after Desert Storm, also added a a the last step, I think it was presentation or something. The Army added a, it's changed over the years. But the Marines added the word utilization as the last step in the intel cycle. So for those of you that are familiar with the old intel cycle, collect, analyze, produce, et cetera, the last step was always dissemination. You hit send and you were done. General Rand Riper said, you're not done when you hit send. Your job is to actually go over to the three and say, did you read it? Are you going to do something about it? You know, um, uh, Desert Storm, we had many examples of that. I don't think he was there that, when it was happening, but, you know, there were... Uh, Frog 7 and MRL units coming down shooting at the MEF headquarters and these things are, rockets are landing all around us. Of course we're extremely interested in making sure someone does something about that. And so, you know, when, they, when the UAVs would see them coming down the road, I mean we'd be calling the Fire Support Coordination Center nonstop. They're on the road, they're getting set up, they're about to shoot. Nobody would ever hit them. Um, we actually had a, Just yeah, so, that, so yeah. The, the intel cycle always was a complete circle. It always was so, a circle. So there was the sense that you started the next cycle by assessing how right. successful the previous one was and filling right. the gaps. Yeah, but, but General Van Riper's point with that word, and, and that was his personal touch, was unless you stick your foot in the door at the Fire Support Coordination Center or stick your foot in the door with the G3 and the G5 and say, what's going on tonight? Did you take any, are you going to take any action tomorrow on these things we found out and told your staff about? So that, that was his point. No, it always was a circle. There always was a feedback loop built in, uh, et cetera. We actually had a young woman captain who was our first lieutenant who was uh, our, um, one of our order of battle officers in the MEF who got in huge trouble one morning because General Boomer came in for the morning brief and it was like the third night in a row that these Frog 7s had plopped around so all around the MEF headquarters and uh, General Boomer said are you guys doing anything to find them <laughs> and instead of saying we're working on it with the three politely she said Yes, sir, three nights in a row we've gone over to the Fire Support Coordination Center and told them exactly where they are, but it appears the safest place on the battlefield is in the cab of the Frog 7. <laughs> Which point General Boomer laughed, but General Bedard did not. And then it was a, it was a fun couple hours after that. We had, to, we had to put her into protective custody. So anyway, General Van Riper's view was, let, let's come up with some principles before we start fighting about what we need to buy and what we need to do. So the next slide, Brian. So... Part of what General Van Riper came up with was, was these were his uh, big six things. Um, inadequate doctrinal foundation. He thought the Marine Corps just didn't have the doctrine, not only for us as intelligence professionals, but we didn't have good doctrine for uh, how operators should understand how to interact with. Um, we had a unit that existed and was killed shortly after Desert Storm, but it was in existence for Desert Storm, called the Surveillance Reconnaissance Intelligence Group, the SHRIG. The, the SHRIG had a chapter in it called uh, intelligence that said to be published and the doctrinal pub for this unit had a the chapter on how to do intelligence support to a MEF or a MEB said to be published and it used to be funny because at night sometimes when we were really tired or something we just said we would jokingly say let's consult doctrine and we would, we would open it up because we kept it there for laughs and it would say to be published um, I put asterisks by two of these because I'm going to talk to them specifically no defined career progression for intelligence officers and insufficient tactical intel support, so I'll talk about those in more detail. Um, we talked about joint manning, like I said, this was right after Goldwater Nichols, and one of the things that General Van Riper did was he wandered around down at the Central Command Joint Intel Center down in Riyadh, and just couldn't understand why there were so few Marines and there were so many sailors, uh, so many soldiers. You know, the Army and the Air Force and the Navy had always done a great job of manning kind of these uh, Joint Intel Center billets, and, they, and again, this is five years after Goldwater Nichols, it's still kind of new. You know, and one of the reasons they're there is that what you what you know it used to be you know in the case of uh, Navy they were FOSIFs and FOSIX and a lot of these things all got rolled in and uh, you know uh, uh, your Atlanta Fleet Intelligence Center Europe and Atlantic you know a lot of these were 
uh, fleet level assets that had been rolled in and Army had theater MI brigades and some of those were kind of scarfed up and stolen and, and the Air Force had uh, reconnaissance technical groups, the RTGs, a lot of them got rolled up into some of these places, but the Marine Corps had no theater level unit for the Joint Commander to steal. So if you walked into these places, there'd be one or two Marines that happened to have been on the Joint Manning document for the J-2 and everybody else was in some other uniform. So he said we ought to try to improve that. Uh, he really thought that we had, an we had an insufficient language capability and, and, and frankly that's the kind of thing that's really hard to fix because you never know where you're going to fight. Um, Army has done a great job since 9-11 of contract hiring linguists to support us. Um, and, uh, and they do that as an executive agent for all the COCOMs. And my own personal opinion is, is, is that except for some of your key billets that really require you to have a top secret SCI access and be, a, and, and be a part of the unit that's standing there trained and know everybody by name, that a large amount of that language capability can be contracted out. It's, it's, a, it's the small subset that, that needs to be part of the force because it's just so hard to maintain. Out of the reserves, out of right, out in Utah. Utah yeah. Yeah. You know, because the, the Mormons go on missions all over the world and there's tons of people in Utah that speak all kinds of crazy languages. It's so, huh? BYU world class language. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they, they're, they're teaching them how to go out and be missionaries, you know, and, and they've got to be able to go out. What, what is it? They go out between age 18 and 21 and go live in a foreign country or something for a year. Yeah. So, and then the last one was imagery capability. Everybody loved imagery because part of what I think that was all about was um, every, every general and colonel in the Marine Corps is an imagery interpreter. You know, they all thought that they, they knew. Are. They are. They, we used they to love, yeah. They love Predator now. Oh yeah, no, everybody likes to watch TV. I think you hear people saying now that the command posts are mesmerized because they're all watching TV. They've all got Predator on live and nobody wants to attack anything unless there's a UAV orbiting over it giving you a continuous picture of the spot. So what we used to do is we used to take synthetic aperture radar imagery into the briefs and use that. Because we figured that way they would not ask for another one. General Van Riper or General Hopkins used to say there's, a, there's an artillery unit that just moved over here, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and we'd, we'd hold up a synthetic aperture radar picture and they would say, oh, okay, next thing, you know. But if it was a real picture, they would have all studied it and talked about it. Um, you know, the, uh, it was always interesting to me, you know, you talk about this not, not being able to conceptualize intelligence. At one point during Desert Storm, we had um, the area that we were fighting and we had a 1 to 50,000 scale map. And in a 1 to 50,000 scale map, a kilometer square box is about a one inch box and so that tells you kind of the scale of a one to fifty thousand map and our area that we were going to fight into took to, to, for that map it took three four by eight sheets of plywood to stick that giant map up it was not unusual for a general or colonel to walk in there and look at that map totally understand the scope and the scale of that map and then turn around and say on the other wall i want a picture of that whole area that shows every tank and you would think to yourself, wait a minute, on that map over there, a tank is the size of a pinhole. If I make it so that you can see every tank on this wall, that map is going to be the size of Nationals Park, you know, or RFK was <laughs> built at the time. But in their mind, they didn't get it. They just would be like, go do it. Okay, sure. So, next slide. Okay, so I, I told you I was going to talk mainly about the officers and what we did to improve tactical intel support. And so, um, one of the things that General Van Riper was death on was this issue of a career progression for intel officers. So the first thing he did was he, he reduced lateral moves. You had to be, there was like a competition if you wanted to lateral move into intelligence. He increased the officer structure, and I'll go into the numbers in a minute, but uh, a significant increase. Um, he did a grade shaping, and grade shaping in the military means if I'm going to have 23, 25 colonels at the top of my pyramid, how many lieutenants I got to stick in the bottom, and how do I have the right number of captains and majors all the way along, and I'll show a picture of that, fix that picture in a second. Increased second lieutenants, back when Larry went, there was a couple dozen a year coming out of Quantico and going to Lowry. We upped that to a couple hundred a year. So it was a big jump. Uh, we created four entry level MOSs that I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, one of the reasons that we did that though was that we wanted to be able to send everybody back to a captain's school like the Army did. And the way the Marine Corps works, because, you know, the Marine Corps is one of these places where we were joking, I don't know who all was in the room, but we were joking when, uh, before this meeting started, and in the Marine Corps, it's a gun club where if you lose your canteen cup, you have to do like a seven-page missing gear statement on why you lost your canteen cup, right? So we're not the kind of place that really wants you to be going to school over and over. We want you to go to work after you're a second lieutenant and never go back to school again. And so uh, we had to think of a way to, to con the Marine Corps into paying for a school for captains to go to. And then most of the warrant officer billets were converted to second lieutenants. So I got my triangle on the next, or Christmas tree as people call it on the next slide. So 
you, this is, you know, Mike, just a, yeah. um, you, you yeah. gave me a flashback when you talked uh -huh. about that ridiculously large map. You know, we actually yeah. did do that for Haiti. Uh -huh. <laughs> the 82nd Airborne in one of their gyms. Oh, on the floor they, of a gymnasium? the entire floor of the gymnasium, and then the commanders literally walked on it. Rock, uh-huh. They did their rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What we used to do is we used to uh, uh, take... Uh, uh, screwdrivers and take the tops off of tank ammo boxes and then we would make a, a, a path down through the sand and that was the road going down in the, and you'd give the commander a big stick and you'd make a giant sand table and with the tent pole you'd walk down the thing that simulated the road and point my battalion's going to be here tomorrow you know that kind of thing but yeah you guys had photos in gymnasiums we didn't have those um, so anyway what we tried to do was we created four entry-level MOS's for second lieutenants and the, the idea was ground intel officers that would also do recon and scout sniper, CI human officers, signals intelligence officers, and air intelligence officers. And then the idea was, and this was also where, and, and, and this might sound like one of the, what, what Homer Simpson always says, duh, or whatever, but General Van Riper's comment was, I want intelligence to be like all of the other MOSs. In all of the other MOSs in the Marine Corps, a second lieutenant, when he first goes out to the field, uh, works for a captain or a first lieutenant who's from his same MOS or her same o MOS. Um, you know, but what the Marine Corps was doing is we were sending second lieutenants out to be battalion S2s and usually the, the uh, infantry major XO was writing their fitness report and giving them advice on how to be a good intel officer. Who hadn't, he had no idea how to be a good intel officer. So he was mainly telling him how to be a good general officer, which helps. But um, So anyway, General Van Riper's goal was to have all these second lieutenants and to create so many of them that they would go places where they would have a fellow intel officer be their boss, at least for their first couple years out in the field. So a scout sniper platoon commander, if you're an 0203, you'd go be a scout sniper platoon commander, and your boss would be the battalion S2. Um, if you were a CI human officer, you'd go be a CI human platoon commander, and your boss would be an intel officer. SIGINT officers, SIGINT platoons, air intel officers, you'd usually go out and be a targeting officer or something in an air group, and your boss would be the group S2, etc. And then the idea was, you'd switch to, the, to what used to be the old Intel MOS 0202. You didn't get that MOS at first, you got it when you became captain. And the reason for that was that the Marine Corps will pay for an MOS producing school, but they won't pay for a school that's just for fun. And so we said, okay, well here's, here's how we're gonna do this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have this, we're gonna have you switch MOSs when you make captain. And you have to go back to school. So that was the theory anyway. Um, and what we sort of did was we shaped this. So you can see here, we're still taking a few lateral moves. We still had a few warrant officers, we had about 80 of them, and I think that's up to about 105 now because we added one new warrant officer MOS back in, uh, the 0205 MOS back in, for those of you that know it. And then, at any given time, we'd have a couple hundred lieutenants, uh, 300 captains, 200 majors, 65 lieutenant colonels, and this is what it was like in uh, 2004. So we still weren't where we wanted to be because 65 lieutenant colonels aren't going to make it to 22 colonels, but we were getting closer. So the next slide. And this just shows kind of how things went. Um, we started off with uh, 478 intel officers and that included all the warrant officers and LDOs. We had a huge spike because we uh, did a lot of recruiting after that first year and we got the first you know, big chunks of people coming out of the basic school. Um, had a little bit of a dip right after that because I think a lot of the people that came out of the basic school thought they were gonna be James Bond or something and suddenly realized that that wasn't what it was all about. Um, and this is kind of sad when this happens, because I was there then and everybody was asking me why it was happening. But in a typical year in the Marine Corps, 8% of the officers get out. You know, for various reasons. They decide to go to college, they decide to go raise a family, they decide to whatever. Uh, what we had was about 10% of the officers got out. And so for, the, for those of you that are math majors, the difference between 8% and 10% is not 2%, it's 25%, right? So we were 25% worse than everybody else for a couple of years there, and we had to figure that out. And we worked on it really hard. And then 9-11 happened and we had another big shot when the Marine Corps was getting ready to jump up to go to, for the war and to go to 202,000. So, but anyway, I mean, to me this is a success story. And of course I had Ron Burgess one time, General, Lieutenant General Burgess, when he was at DIA, he said, he said, I don't know why I'm giving you a medal for doubling the strength of the Marine Corps. It wasn't that big to begin with, you know? But, <laughs> so, but doubling is doubling, right? So I still, I still want credit. So, next slide. So the other thing that we talked about was, um, insufficient tactical intelligence support. So this was across the board. Um, the problem with our enlisted force was we needed to tweak the schoolhouses a little bit, but mainly there just wasn't enough of them. 
So what we did was we increased all the S2s and G2s. We put a lot more people into all source analysis and imagery analysis. We had a big increase in our counterintelligence and human intelligence positions. Uh, we did a lot of organizational things. We created, as we got all this new structure and the Marine, the intelligence force began to grow, we moved from having intelligence companies to intelligence battalions. So we created three intelligence battalions. We created an intelligence support battalion in the reserves. We created the third radio battalion. And right around kind of the tail end of the time I was, I was leaving the Marine Corps, um, Larry reminded me of this earlier, but we created an intelligence company which later became an intelligence battalion in Marine Special Operations Command. And so the Marine Corps went from basically having uh, two SIGINT battalions prior to Desert Storm to having uh, three SIGINT battalions because we created another one. We created a reserve battalion. We created, uh, we made MCIA command and we made all these intel battalions. So uh, one of the ways that lieutenant colonels make colonel is uh, to command a battalion. And so what we did is we created a bunch of battalions for them to command. Uh, as General Van Riper would tell you that they uh, did not uh, command make-believe battalions. They had to have a real mission and real things to do. And uh, I think it uh, paid off because by the time we got to uh, OIF in 2003 and they were deploying into theater, there was at least some understanding of what a G2 did. Staffs use intel, battalions collect and produce intel. Um, there was those lanes in the road and the doctrine was evolving. So the next slide is just about the people on the enlisted side or, or the uh, total force. We went from being 1.6% of the Marine Corps, this is total officers and enlisted, and went up to almost 5,000 by, uh, so we were about 2.8% of the Marine Corps. Uh, and that number actually uh, is m most interesting, I think, because the Marine Corps that you see in the lower left is that 196,000 man Marine Corps. And this is that 175,000 man Marine Corps over here. So it, it was a big jump for the Marine Corps to go down 13% and increase intel by 100%, basically. So we talked a little bit about, going next slide, uh, kind of about, you know, kind of how this all played out by the time we got to 2003. Can you go back one, Brian, or not? Is that doable? There you go. Um, yeah, so 9-11 is about here. And there's, there's a big jump after 9-11, too. But for those of you that are in the room here that were, that were in uh, OIF and OEF, can you imagine if you had been this many instead of this many when the balloon went up? I mean, it just, and, and didn't have battalions, didn't have the equipment, didn't have the units. You know, I, uh, a lot of this was put in place before I got there, the, the uh, kind of the, the kernel, the notion of it with General Van Riper. But um, we, had, we had Marines, you know, six months in Iraq, six months home, six months in Iraq, six months home. If we had, if we had only had this many, I don't know what we would have done. I guess it would have been nine months in Iraq, three months home. Nine months in Iraq, three, I, I don't know what we would have done. So uh, this, this served us really well. Next slide. And of course, this is just kind of a, uh, a slide that uh, one of our intel officers put together at the unclass level to just show kind of, and what this allowed us to do is it allowed us at every place where there was a battalion throughout the area or, or an RCT, in the case of Al-Assad, there was a regimental combat team headquarters here and a battalion but it gave us the ability to put SIGINT teams at places on the battlefield that they weren't during Desert Storm. During Desert Storm, we had SIGINT teams basically at the division, you know, and sometimes at a couple of the regiments. Go to OIF, we have SIGINT teams and CI human teams down at every battalion. Um, you go over to Afghanistan a couple of years later, which isn't part of, which I'll talk about in a minute, and all those things are at the company level. So a company forward operating base now has a small SIGINT team and usually has some type of a CI human detachment, maybe it's only a couple of Marines, but it gives them that capability. So, and all the comms to hook all this together were bought, Trojan Spirits, Cipronet going everywhere. I had, I had one uh, regimental uh, OPSO come up to me after uh, OIF-1, we were at some kind of a ground dinner or something, and, and he said he was contemplating naming his next child Trojan Spirit, because it was his favorite thing in the war, you know, was to, he, couldn't, he couldn't believe that you could actually have this vehicle be driven, Army developed it, have, the, have this thing driving along and you, on the fly just stop and fold up this antenna on a trailer and pull some cables out of the back of the Humvee and start typing on Cipronet. You know, because so, uh, so much of the war is fought in PowerPoint now. That's why I'm using PowerPoint tonight. Next slide. Um, this is kind of what it looked like on the battlefield when we're doing irregular warfare or counterinsurgency. Um, the G2 has a huge fusion center and these are all the little teams that he has there. He had a collections. He had political intelligence cell, cross-boundary fusion, because they were always trying to w look for terrorists that were working the... Terrorists can figure out 
you know, the insurgents can figure out where the boundaries are between the units. So we had some intelligence people just focusing on what terrorist groups were trying to work the boundaries. We would deploy an intel battalion and a radio battalion. The intel battalion ran the fusion center and the CI human center. We sent a, a CI human technical control element and a human exploitation team down to the battalion level. And some of those guys would actually wind up down at the company task force. Operational control and analysis center for the SIGINTERS. And this is, you know, before the meeting we were talking about things like GeoCell and RTERG and those things are all happening down at these levels. And it, it's, just a, it's just a picture that if someone had showed me a picture like that during Desert Storm and said, we're planning to put all this stuff down here at the company level, I would have, I would have said, you know, where's that coming from? We can barely read all the message traffic that's coming in to our headquarters, let alone offer people down at that echelon. But the battalions were able to do that. And one of the battalion, each of these battalion commanders, when they would come back, they would normally tell me that only 40% of their battalion was up here and 60% of it was down here usually. So, next slide. And of course, uh, General Flynn had a lot of fun with this article that he wrote, wrote uh, called Fixing Intel, a, a Blueprint for Making Intelligence Relevant in Afghanistan. Uh, one of his co-authors was a Marine Intel officer, Pottinger, uh, helped him write that. And th uh, throughout this uh, document, uh, General Flynn, to, to the chagrin of some of even his fellow Army uh, brethren, he, he, would, he would be talking about, and this is how you ought to do something, do this and do this. And then he would say, and I was just down visiting the 3rd Battalion, you know, 2nd Marines S2 shop, and they're doing this. You know, and so several times through there, I'm sure Pottinger helped stick that in there, but, you know, um, you know he was constantly referring to the, this Marine Battalion did it this way, this Marine Battalion did it that way. And so we all had a lot of fun with that. Um, next slide. So what did the Marine Corps do? Um, in uh, 2008 through 2011, the Marine Corps was told, hey, this six months in country, six months out is a little bit too rough on the troops. We want to try to get you to a two to one rotation, meaning you're in country for six months, you're home for a year, or you're in for nine months, you're home for 18, or however you want to structure it. I think the Army was doing, trying to do one and two, right, or something. And um, so the Marine Corps had to go from 175,000 to 202,000. And so uh, in order to do that, the Marine Corps had to grow by 15%. But by that point, so many people so many operations officers in the Marine Corps, and we talked earlier, Chuck Colvard's article where he said, we need to make operators want intel, we need to make operators understand intel, understand why intel is important, understand why intel is something that's worth investing in. By the time we get to 2008, the Marine Corps convenes this huge group of colonels and a couple of generals, and they get together and they talk about, okay, we're being told to go from 175,000 to 202,000. What are we going to spend that on? And of course, the first thing is a couple of more helicopter squadrons, a couple of more infantry battalions, et cetera. But one of the things that, he, that they do is they say, we want a whole lot more intel people. So they recommend taking Marine Corps intelligence from around 5,000, by 2008 it was around 5,000 people, which was almost up to 3%. And it's kind of off the screen down here, but the Marine Corps was growing by 15% and intel was growing by 21% because the colonels that came together that had been commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan came together and said, if I had one thing different, I would have, you know, three or four or five more intel people in my unit. Um, that's what I want. And so a lot of these battalion S2s that had four or five people in them suddenly had eight people in them and things like that. So to me, if you start to look at, um, you know, what, what makes you successful, one of the things that makes you successful is people wanting you around, wanting more from you, wanting to give you some resources to make things work better. And, and you know, this goes to show that that's where we were. Of course, the next slide is the bad news, um, that the Marine Corps is probably, this is from the uh, OSD Comptroller's uh, budget rollout last year this time, um, and that's where he brought the bad news out that the Marine Corps is probably going to end, uh, ended last year at around 190, and, and may very well, if sequester goes into effect, go to 175. And I remember having a meeting with Larry, uh, Larry and I had a meeting a couple of years ago talking about this sequester, and we both agreed that it was going to happen because it was the easiest thing for a politician to do is let the government be on autopilot. Because you can make all the speeches you want, you don't have to really do anything. And that's what happened. You know, sequester's happening, basically. Um, so, you know, what we have now is the Marine Corps, and, then I, and the other bad news is that the, the, the uh, when General Amos was up on the Hill last year testifying, he said that the absolute floor for the Marine Corps is 174,000. And then, the Secretary of Defense did the skimmer, the Strategic Choices Management Review, a year and a half ago. And in the skimmer, one of the numbers they tested for the Marine Corps was 150,000. That's really scary to get down to that number. 
So, we don't know, what? 380 for the Army. Yeah, no, everybody's getting smaller. So, um, hopefully we're gonna go to these uh, goal without sequester numbers, and that'll be as low as we go. So, my, next, my last slide is uh, this one, which is, Marine Corps is gonna get smaller. Is it gonna go down to 186 or lower? I don't know. We already know that the force structure review group the Marine Corps held said that it, when, when the numbers go down, we're gonna go down to 24 infantry battalions, we're gonna drop nine flying squadrons, we're gonna cut logistics groups, but we're gonna to add to special ops, and a, a big chunk of this addition to special ops, by the way, was intelligence people. It took that MARSOC intel unit from company to battalion strength. Um, I think they, they ended up not calling it a battalion, I think they wound up calling it two companies or something, but, um, and uh, CMC put the floor at 174, and the skimmer's looking at anything from 150 to 175, um, uh, next slide is my last one, actually. So what do I think is going to happen to Marine Corps intelligence? I think that um, on the backs of all of you in here that are intel officers that are still on active duty and intel Marines that are still on active duty, you, you did such a great job in the past 10 years that I think we're going to probably walk away from the end of this staying at around five to 6,000. We're probably going to be close to 3% of the Marine Corps end strength because when you cut a battalion, like if you go to an infantry battalion and cut the battalion, you only lose eight or 10 intel people. You know, you don't lose, whereas the infantry, when they cut a battalion, they lose 800 in infantry people. Same with squadrons. Squadron S2s are actually smaller because they get a lot of their support from the air group level. So very tiny numbers. Um, almost everybody that I talked to said that they wish they had an entire CI human team and an entire SIGINT team at the company level for most scenarios. And I think that's gonna cause most commanders who are now colonels are going to say, I don't want you to cut any CI human or any SIGINT. And that's where the bulk of the Marine Corps Intel manpower is, is in those specialties. Um, and so I think that the S2 cuts aren't as impactful as if someone was cutting SSTs and HETs. And that the MARSOC increases are probably going to stand, if not get bigger. And every time MARSOC adds, they, they add a big chunk of Intel because uh, when, those, when those, uh, those, those companies that go out from MARSOC, which have whatever they have, 150 people, they take the same number of Intel Marines as a Marine Expeditionary Unit takes, basically. I mean, it's a huge slice of uh, people that go out with a, one of those companies to do intelligence support to them. I was telling somebody before the, this started that um, General Lake had uh, an outgoing MARSOC company commander when he came back from Afghanistan and said, well, now you're going to make major and you're going to wind up having to be the, you know, the regimental S3 or something. What are you going to miss the most? He said, I'm gonna, what, the thing I'm going to miss the most is my Intel Direct Support Team. He said, that's like throwing away the keys to your Corvette. He said, I cannot believe that, you know, that as a major in Afghanistan, I had as much Intel support as a MU commander, basically, and it's great. And so that was a good thing for us. So that was all I got. If there's any questions, I was told that you guys didn't have to stay here for happy hour. You can go to a bar. But questions, plenty of questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, to what extent was the nature of the, the war uh, in each case considered in, in these uh, decisions. And that, by that I mean, you know, uh, coin or yeah. uh, counterinsurgency and all that is, is just a really intelligence intensive effort. Yeah. And so uh, you've, got to, you've got to get people down to the, the name level of knowledge as opposed to unit description, what have you. And so uh -huh. uh, obviously, a lot more people are required to yeah. that. No, and I, and I think that's what we saw, is, is if you had gone to, we had a uh, force structure review in the Marine Corps right after OIF-1. Um, and right after OIF-1, people said, it was really hard to have these little backpack UAVs at the Battalion S2, because there wasn't somebody whose job was, it was to run them. Could I have one more guy added to my Battalion S2 to take care of all the backpack UAVs and give them out to the companies and all that? So their, their, their thought process was, I'm a battalion, I'm maneuvering as part of a regiment, the regiment's maneuvering as part of a division, and we're all online and we're going. Um, by the time um, the next force structure review occurred in the Marine Corps, we had been in these battalion forward operating bases in Iraq, and even to some extent company forward operating bases, um, and there was more desire to have more intel capability pushed down to those battalions, and that was where we were doing COIN. And then we went to Afghanistan, and we started having companies that were really a great distances from their battalion headquarters. And so when 2008 came around and they were doing that, okay, the Marine Corps is gonna to grow to 202K, that's when all those colonels came in and said, hey, all my company commanders and battalion commanders are demanding CI human support, SIGINT support, backpack UAV operators. Um, I, I keep calling it backpack UAV because they keep changing the names. There's 
ravens and pumas and all these things, dragon eyes. But, you know, so um, I think that you're right. And, and if you go into the Marine Corps right now and just go in and go into Google and Google company landing team, CLT, the Marine Corps has got this huge experiment going on right now about company landing teams. And what this experiment is about is what happens when we drop a company off on an island or in a distant area in a V-22 somewhere and they have to operate by themselves for a while. Well, the first thing they found out was they need a lot more comms and a lot more intel when these companies are off by themselves. And so you're right, it's, it's the environment and it's how they're being used. Yeah? <clears throat> Sir, was there a direct relationship to the uh, increase in manning to the, I'm guessing the quantity of product increase, but the quality and the relevancy of the intel being provided? Yes. No, I mean, I mean, commanders, commanders were coming to you all the time, and they would come home from the war and come by and talk to myself and the general when, when we had a general there and, and, and at headquarters. And they would say, you know, I had a rule that we didn't go out at night, but we went out at night a lot when they, we had a SIGINT team with us because they saw things and told us to go there. Um, and sometimes we'd go out twice in one night. And, you know, and when you've got guys that have been out in the desert all day walking around and they're dead tired and they're dehydrated and the commander wakes them up and says, it's worth going out in the dark tonight, we're going to that house, we're going to that vehicle, you know. So, I mean, that's that target quality, you know, no dry holes when you, when you go something, when you drill, you know. And uh, so, you know, there are not too many cordon and knocks where nothing happened when you cordoned and knocked, you know, uh, a lot of the time. Very detailed planning for things like Fallujah, um, where the commanders had a huge input because they knew months in advance they were going to retake Fallujah. And so MCA did a, just a yeoman's work between them and the intelligence battalion forward on um, you know, like the tanker, the tank battalion comes in and says, we want a map that shows every road where two tanks can go down next to each other down the road. So the tankers had their own map of Fallujah and their map had green road. All the roads were brown except the ones that were green and the ones that were green could have, it was called the tandem tank mobility map. And it meant two tanks could go down next to each other. Every tanker had one of those. You know what I mean? So all these customized products, they were very tailored. Yeah. You know, just to count your question about coin, uh, what happened mm -hmm. in the Army, um, and you talked about it being tactically focused, Mike, mm -hmm. which is one of the themes that you, yeah. you hit on. You know, our, at the beginning of the war, our brigade uh, intelligence shops, yes, two shops, had six people in it. That grew to 32. Right. That's pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. um, we also had combined uh, CI, which is counterintelligence, and QMIT. Mm -hmm. In our infinite wisdom, we thought that would be more efficient, but we realized the error in our ways, so we... <laughs> We separated that back yeah. out and had substantial growth in yeah. those two disciplines. Yeah, but well, we've we've left that error in our ways. But you know we're smaller, and so uh, you know Dave will tell me if I'm wrong. But I I still think in the, at at the size the Marine Corps is, it's probably right to have your because you know which which guy's a strat debriefer? Is it a CI guy or a human guy? Well, it was both. You know, mm -hmm. which guy's your interrogator? Well, they're both trained to interrogate. Okay, well <laughs> you know at what point do you get to where there's something different about them? You know if you can train them together. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, yeah, Noah. Thanks. This is this has really been great for me to hear. Coming, I came into the Marine Corps in the first 0203 yeah. um, intelligence class, and I can remember going through the Mitzi with 0205 warrant officers who then watched it going away. Yeah. And Van Rank was absolutely vilified. Oh yeah, they hated him. Group. They hated him, and so it's just it's it's very interesting to me to hear because I think what this is as much about. Intel and you know how the Marine Corps needed to change, to change Intel, but it's also about leading change in that yeah. way. And the thing that I hear mainly from this presentation is how much was General Van Riper. And it, it, in so many instances, you say, "Well, and General yeah. Van Riper said this," and General yeah. Van Riper said, that's amazing to me that, that it was so because I mean it was attributed to him, but. In the back of my mind, I'm half thinking, yeah, but it, it can't be that one guy. I mean, but it sounds no, like but I mean, but, the, but these were very fundamental things. General Van Riper was a very He'd, he'd grown up in the Marine Corps, he'd been in the Marine Corps 35 years, and he knew that, you know, you couldn't make sergeant before you were a Lance Corporal. I mean, you know, in his mind, he kept saying, why aren't you guys like everybody else? Why don't lieutenants work for captains? Why don't you go to school long enough? You know, you know pilots go to school for a year. Why are you guys going to school for 10 weeks and then trying to be a battalionist? I mean, he asked very fundamental questions like, why do you do it that way? Why do you do it that way? And sometimes he would get off on tangents, and I, I remember he had one talk he used to give about professionalizing the intel force. I kept saying, you, you can't say that. You really have to say, I'm going to make it bigger. I'm going to make it even more professional. I said, but, but the limited duty officers that you know, have been around for years, they really aren't going to like you if you keep going around saying, I'm going to professionalize this, because they, they all thought they were professionals, and they were. You know, it's just that they, they were incapable of making colonel, you know, and there just weren't enough of them. You know, I mean, so I mean, let's, let's phrase it differently, but you're on the right track. And I 
um, yeah. Because PX Kelly said you couldn't get promoted as a pure Intel officer. Right. But right. we were richly commuted, uh, recruited by other parts of the Intel community. Oh yeah. Gen yeah. General uh, General Clapper went to uh, in college went to Marine uh, uh, Officer yeah. Candidate School PLC at Camp Upshur down in Quantico, and his dad was an Air Force officer. And his dad said, what are you doing? And he said, I want to be a Marine Intel officer. And his dad said, you're never going to be able to make general that way. You might not even make colonel. And he said, oh, okay, what do you think I ought to do, Dad? Go in the Air Force. You know, he made three star, now he's the DNI. But, you know, we used to give him, whenever he would, we used to always give him stuff like little Marine shot glasses and things that... He still has that photo in his office. Oh, it does he? <laughs> so, that yeah. That's off what, what Larry had yeah. said. I mean, I, I've been doing military intelligence now almost 25 years. Almost mm -hmm. 20 of that as an officer. I, like Noah, was among the first officers commissioned in the mid-90s. Yeah. I went, to, I went to SIGINT, and you know, you, you had two different MOSs, 0202 and 2602, that were radically different. 0202, yeah. generally by all accounts, a miserable experience. 2602, great, they had a lot of leadership opportunities. This plan allowed all the MOSs to merge together. I mean, right now, as a Lieutenant Colonel of Marines, I'm looking at any given year up to 14 command opportunities in intel-related units mm -hmm. specifically, and depending on, those aren't available every year, and depending on the year, another three or four to maybe six non-intel command opportunities. Yeah. And command opportunities prior below battalion command as well. We'll see you, Colin. And we've got the first- Thanks, Thanks for coming. We've got the first Marine three-star that came out of intelligence, who was a pure intel officer at that, I, I do believe. Yeah. Vince Stewart. He started off as a tanker, I think, for yeah. one tour. That's right. But uh, no, I mean, part of, and I didn't mention the recon battalions, but because intel officers can command recon platoons, right. they're often in competition to command recon battalions later. And at any given time, Two, or two out of three of the recon battalions seem to have an intel officer in command. The, the success um, of the, the Van Riper plan mm -hmm. has been amazing. Like we, couldn't, we cannot imagine Marine Corps intelligence now without what was done back in 94. No, it, it, I, I, uh, my hat's off to General Van Riper for coming up with it. And you know, when he was interviewing people for the job, he said, what do you think it's going to take to make this intel plan work? And I said, I think what you're going to probably have to do is hire some asshole to be your deputy because, <laughs> yes. because someone's going to have to freeze this, this plan in place for 10 years and do all the budget work and all the school quota work and all that because uh, after 10 years, 90% of the Marine Corps will have turned over and all the majors that are out in the, in the fleet 10 years later on their second or third tour in the fleet is just going to think that's the way life's always been. But I said the trick's going to be not having those limited duty officers overturn what you've done in the next five years because someone fails to follow through on all that planning, programming, and budgeting. And that was kind of my job. And I like to think that I was an extremely good asshole, you know. But, um, you know, the, t to talk about the LDOs, and I don't know if Dave had to live through any of this, but um, when the, when the uh, 0204s, the CI Humit officers first came out, um, the LDO CI Humiters said, oh, you're just staff officers. You're not, I know the billet says you're a platoon commander, but you're really not. And do you remember when Kobar Towers blew up in, uh, in Dharan? Um, we received a message saying, could you send over a CI human unit to help us, you know, help OSI with counter surveillance and that kind of stuff. We put together a unit from Camp Lejeune, we sent it over, uh, and the LDOs conspired to have no uh, regular officers on that deployment. Not only that, but when they got over there, they crafted a message for the J2 to send back to say, we need 10 more people, comma, and make sure none of them are 0204s. <laughs> that was actually a joint message that came out, a request for forces message, you know, and we knew who wrote it. <laughs> the 0204, situation is, I would say, the, the, the one aspect of the Van Riper plan that is still sort of being worked through. Yeah. Uh, and yet it still works very well. And mm -hmm. They have, have come from a ground intel background and now in command of CI Human for a year and a half can definitely speak to that. Yeah. So. It's, things are better. Well, it's definitely. I mean, it's been how many years since, you know, April 4th hit the, hit the yeah. streets. Uh, and you still get the 0210 that thanks will buy us by the way. <laughs> You'll see that even when we send CDs to the cats down the street, when they attach over to a view or they go into support, whatever unit anywhere, it's normally a CWO2, CWO3 who's in charge of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting to me because having been an infantry platoon commander before, I, you know, um, my platoon sergeant had been in the Marine Corps for 12 or 13 years, and I'd been in the Marine Corps for eight months, and I was his boss. You know, and we would deploy and the, and the battalion would come down and they say, we need a platoon on a forward outpost and we're ashore for an exercise like in Tunisia or Spain or somewhere or Oman. And they just would say, 
Lieutenant, take your unit off by itself, 20 kilometers over that way, and make sure your radios work. You know, and we'd go, and that staff sergeant never questioned that I was supposed to be in charge. But for some reason, there there must be some little mafia kind of of retired guys that's still telling those warrant officers they're not supposed to listen to the lieutenants. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh? It's 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 being taped. Oh, I don't know. We won't tell anybody who it is. The IG's gone. Yeah. He had to go to school. Huh? Right, yeah. Yeah, do, do we need O204? Do we need a second lieutenant to go to the schoolhouse to be a collector? Uh, well, that O204 can someday be a G2X, a J2X. Right, you're the first yeah. M2X. I'm an M2X. I'm no an M2X. Two 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 yeah. Do you need that? And that's the thing, too. Maybe there's a different course they can go to, or maybe there's a different feeder MOS besides CI human officer yeah. that you can have where he's a collections officer. I mean, part, part of our thought was that we were trying to create somebody who could be a MEF or a MEB G2X, in other words, to run the CI Human Operations Center for a task force. Um, and this kind of this whole J2X doctrine evolved. I think the first J2X was, was in Haiti for one of the coups or earthquakes there in the mid-90s, and, and that's when that term came in vogue. And it was right around the time we were standing this all up, and we said, well, that's one of the goals we have is that if we're going to do more in the joint world, we should be able to generate these people. But as Larry said, we're training everybody to be a collector and to be a case officer, and uh, we're, not trying, we're not training you necessarily to be a CI human manager, and maybe, the, maybe there's a way to do that. It's I say we, but I'm not there anymore. I've been gone for five years. So. It's got to be a much yeah. in sport element for yeah. each I'm there in spirit. collector. You know, yeah. We have more collectors than we have support. Management. Yeah. So uh -huh. I think that's where O2O4 has a little bit better. Okay. Well, I have in uh, Somalia, I had a full CI team, uh, old style, uh, all warrant officers uh, uh, supporting me, and they, they were marvelous, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and in fact, General Hughes uh, did a letter, one of the letters to General Van Riper saying, you, you know, what are you doing here? This is a big problem. Yeah. These guys are, are incredible. But the fact of the matter is, you can't make enough of them. You just can't. The, the pipeline, and the, the process for creating them is just not, and and, uh, and and so it's if we'd have followed that model into uh, uh, past 9/11, it would be a terrible situation. I mean, you know, it's just mm -hmm. there's not the capacity. Well, and a big part of fixing the problem, frankly, was creating CI human companies because what happened before was there was a CI team at every wing and every base and every FSSG. And when we brought them together to be a company, that's when their requirement evolved for a company commander and for platoon commanders. But it used to be they were kind of on their own. And then when you deployed for wartime, then they kind of all got pulled from their bases and they all kind of ad hoc showed up and formed a unit. It was very awkward. Yeah, Tom. Sir, uh, one of your problems when you go with the, the warrant officer and LDO problem is that, like right now, right now in the geospatial community, we're looking at, we need something. And the argument, of course, from the, from the, the troops is, we want warrant officers and LDOs. Your problem is is that you isolate your community. You just take your own community, right? Isolating it from mm -hmm. the greater goal of getting people that can be colonels and right and that that full up. You just isolate yourself even yeah. more. It really doesn't solve the problem yeah. for you. It, it becomes like West Virginia. It's all the DNA is the same. <laughs> they could Go win ahead. tonight, though. They could win tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, again, just curious. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I was a user from from 94 when the force structure made the change when, when did you see the uh, uh, the dynamic of um, the uh, shift from former Soviet Union tactics Intel collection etc uh, after 9/11 change to where you had a very uh, a credible coin Intel community it probably wasn't until around 2006. I mean, it was 12 years after the Intel plan, but there was a huge amount of work being done in that area. The, the units that we put together to do the Marine Expeditionary units, and a Marine Expeditionary would take, you know, would take 50 or 60 intelligence people with them. Um, we began to be very careful at selecting the majors and captains that led those units, the, the, uh, the, the by-int discipline, the imagery chief and all that, because we knew that those guys were out on the tip of the spear, and those are the people that went into Kosovo that, I mean, we had one MU that went into Albania, pulled out, went around, went into Kosovo, pulled out, and went and did a humanitarian assistance in Turkey 
all in six in a six month deployment they were two months two months two months and so they were very much into irregular warfare coin terrorism force protection issues and all that the muse were really good at it and so uh, i used to say all the time before uh, oif and oef the best general officers to talk to and try to talk about intelligence were the ones that had been, as colonels had been mu commanders because if a colonel was a regimental commander or a air group commander and made general the odds were he had never touched intelligence because he was busy worried about the flight plan at you know Beaufort, South Carolina, or he was worried about you know not having an accidental discharge at Camp Pendleton. The moment all those colonels in the air groups and the regiments started deploying, you know, then all of that leadership started really caring about intelligence. It's been a, it's been a huge change to have when you have a meeting of all of the general officers now they're all talking about the importance of ISR. I think that's so. why I was getting yeah, to yeah, where I was yeah. going to because yeah. strategically it sounds like that's when the change occurred, but. Uh, in the late 80s, maneuver warfare, uh, small wars manual, at yeah. the grassroots level, we read all that. Yeah, we didn't put it into practical application mm -hmm. until later on, but yeah. um, we understood it so you could adapt to all those things. No, I mean, I, I was, uh, as an infantry, I was a battalion S3 Alpha as an infantry officer at, uh, and then a battalion S3 as a first lieutenant down in Camp Lejeune when General Gray was the division commander. And we were out doing these free play maneuver warfare things. We all had to read Bill, Bill Lynn's book on the OODA loop, you know, and all that stuff that came out in the early 80s or late, late 70s, whenever it was. But we were maneuvering against invisible enemies. The important thing was, can you get your whole battalion overnight in the dark from LZ Bluebird to LZ X-Ray or whatever? It, was, it had nothing to do with, you know, did you deliberately, you know, discern where the enemy was and decide how to attack him? It was all about um, movement. It was about maneuvering. In 1990. Before, yeah. <laughs> before it was yeah. the so. fashionable. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Hey, on that point, um, yeah. when you showed the Van Riper bullets, I was yeah. kind of looking through those and reflecting in some ways, right? Those were mm -hmm. written 20-something years ago, yeah. right? And I was trying to think of how I would change those today, if, if at all. Yeah. And mostly I would. Um, mm -hmm. The one that really resonates with me was the last one about utilization. It's you know, yeah. a step beyond last. dissemination. Mm -hmm. But the one that might be changed or improved, even though it still you know, holds true, is to your point, sort of, the one that says intelligence drives operations. Mm -hmm. While that's you know, still very true, I think in the Navy and in the Marine Corps, probably all the services, um, more now than ever, I might, if I were to poll the three stars I sit at the table with, they might change that to intelligence is operations. Right. You know, and, and, and that shows the, the transformation that's probably occurred in the last 20 years of, of how the commanders take mm -hmm. ownership of it now in a way they didn't used to. Well, and of course, now, and nowadays you're, you're doing intelligence operations exactly. to kind of excite the enemy system and, and get them to reveal more than they would have revealed right. if they were at rest. I mean, I remember, yeah. when, you know, 20, 25 years ago when I first came in, we, we were reluctant to say intelligence operations. You know, it was almost mm -hmm. like you were forbidden to say right. it, as though it was... Mm -hmm. Uh, illegal or and the Navy actually reversed the, Na the Navy always said op intel right, right. you know and, and so yeah so now we're not you know we're, we're not ashamed to say that anymore right, right. because we realize the role in oh yeah but we have but really codified yeah. that, that phrase in, intel drives ops it, it really yeah. means something right. after that experience now I haven't worked with the Army in Baghdad recently as a J2 mm -hmm. I can tell you somehow in the Army there's a a sense of not trusting their intel officers as much amongst army general officers that, yeah. that I've seen. I'm not sure where that's rooted, but I've had numerous army officers of different MOSs tell me that. Whereas in, in the Corps of Marines and in, in the Navy, we believe in intel driving operations. The Army is relearning a few things now coming out of the lesson. Yeah, and, it, and I think the other thing you hit on too, it kind of depends on where you've served and where that officer has spent his time yeah. and how he consumed intelligence in that mm -hmm. job. Same is true in the mm -hmm. environment I'm in today. I can almost, you know, stereotype the person based on what jobs he's had yeah. in terms of how easy it's going to be to deliver intelligence to them. Well, and it's still, you know, you're always going to have your your 10%. Uh, I work I work with Tony, who's in the back there, and he was an infantry platoon commander in Iraq, and he tells a few great stories about some people that worked in his battalion S2 and some scary stories. Yeah. You know, and so it's all going to depend on on whether or not. You, and and one of the reasons we're trying to put together a system in the Marine Corps where it's not just one second lieutenant be in the battalion S2, but there's a captain who's the S2, and he's got two lieutenants working for him. One is his deputy, one's his scout sniper platoon commander, and they can choose where to put the weaker one to learn more before you put him in the other one. You know, whereas before it was sink or swim. There's only one second lieutenant intel officer in the battalion. I guess you're the two. You know, 
And so um, yeah, there's a little more flexibility built. The numbers give commanders a little more flexibility now to move people around. And sometimes we see these intel lieutenants are being made like the weapons company XO or something just because they want to, the, the commander likes them and says, I think you deserve a little leadership time and then come back and be my two. So yeah, um, they're all G2s different. Were not keen on I know, Division G2s don't, the job. takes away from the intel job, yeah. So, all right, well, I was supposed to talk for an hour and take questions and I don't want anybody to fall asleep on the job here. But uh, if anybody wants my card, I'll email them the brief. I have one copy on the CD here that I brought that someone can have. And uh, if you're not interested in the brief, I'll know because no one will come and ask for it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>